A very good morning to one and all of you, and my thanks to Gaurav for remember me, remembering me for his uh, very popular course. So taking you on to phaco emulsification in the presence of corneal opacity and compromised cornea. So here, there are two challenges. You are doing a cataract surgery to visually rehabilitate the patient, but then you're challenged that you could be potentiating the corneal disease which is there. The second thing is, the corneal disease, by the compromise which is already created, the lack of visibility which comes therein, limits a good cataract surgery. So that is a two-way challenge which we have. So what do you do? Probably the best thing is to start looking right from the ocular surface. At least try to treat the ocular surface because you need to do an optimal biometry in these patients and what best you can get in the existing scenario. And of course, you want a comfortable patient post-op. You might have done an ideal uh, surgery and uh, you have not treated the dry eye disease. It could be an additive problem. So you need to use adequate lubricants. If it's a severe dry eye coexistent with a corneal disease, use punctal plugs. Treat the inflammation with topical steroid drops and start the topical steroid drops prior to the surgery itself. Definitely it goes without saying that you should use preservative-free medications only. And then comes important, like where do you plan your wound? You need to look at those areas of corneal thinning which could be there in the periphery, the area of scarring, and do uh, you place your incision most optimally. Essentially, all of what I say is just to avoid triggering an exacerbation of the corneal disease. Now, running you through this very uh, uh, case, it's a moderate pupil and a significant corneal opacity, but thankfully not lying in the central visual area. So first, you go back and inject viscoelastic and then do a sinuculysis with a blunt spatula. Then, in this particular scenario, it made sense to place uh, iris retractors to sort of enlarge the pupil. It gives you greater visibility. And you often can use, of course, a dye, Typhon blue, and then go along the pupillary margin, and it's largely, and if you're fairly good in rexis, you are able to get away with it. Start your phaco emulsification, slowly, I mean, slow motion phaco, and of course, try to do it in the uh, vis visual area. Do a stop and chop, which may be the e easiest way of dealing with this moment. And then, when the cortex removal becomes a bit of a challenge, but again, you go just along the pupillary margin, just, just below, which you already know where the cortex is going to lie. And you are able to remove most of the cortex. Sometimes a gentle hydro would loosen some of those cortex, which is recalcitrant. And sometimes, after placing an IOL, the visibility becomes better. You are able to visualize those uh, sheets of cortex and go ahead and remove it. And then, you are able to get off with this particular surgery. Yes, again, you could do a PTK if the, uh, to uh, sort of uh, make the thicker opacities become thinner, or you could scrape the calcium plaque in a band shape at keratopathy, but essentially the surgery has to be done very carefully. Now this is a case, of course, was planned for a PK. Sometimes just a mechanical debridement might thin out the op area of opacity so that you're able to visualize a bit below, of course, sinuculysis, using dye, and a careful hydro are all steps which I've already told you, and we need to be again and again careful in these guys. Those patients are demanding, and you need to be optimal. And then a uh, uh, multi-quadrant hydro could be done, and then going on to do the phaco emulsification. But by sometimes by doing this mechanical debridement or a PTK, you're actually able to see through the haze in the corneal opacity, and that helps you to go on with your surgery. And once the IOL plays, herein, of course, you use a trivine and remove the diseased uh, corneal tissue, and then now all that is left is to a, a PK or uh, uh, anchoring sutures and complete the case. Now, this is a situation of a nebular corneal opacity, and then the patient has significant astigmatism. And if the central pupillary area is a little devoid of opacity, so you are able to measure the regular astigmatism in this eye, you could go ahead and uh, place a toric IOL, because we all know toric IOL takes care of the regular astigmatism, and the irregular component is not going to be corrected. Sometimes you could do, if the corneal thickness allows, you could do a topo-guided regularization of the corneal opacity to make the irregular cornea more regular if it is possible. Sometimes these are just impractical thoughts which cannot be validated. And then go ahead with a appropriate surgery using the markers, the usual amount of attention to
to detail which is needed in a toric IOS and position it properly, you are at least able to debulk significant amount of astigmatism in this cornea and doing your best to the patient even in a suboptimal situation is mandated. Invariably, in these kind of opacities, you are able to get the K value of the same eye, but otherwise, you could take the K value of the opposite eye. But again, when you're planning a toric IOL in a younger patient who might need a PK again uh, graph, then we need to keep in mind that it makes sense not to place a toric IOL at all in these cases because if you're going to do a regraft, then what is going to happen, it's a corneal astigmatism which is being corrected and when you remove it, then the, uh, the atoric IOL uh, the, um, uh, correction, it becomes a manifest astigmatism and that's definitely not the uh, uh, answer in a younger patient, so monofocal IOL makes sense. Of course, these problems would not occur with a DSEC or a DMEC which is being done. Now this is another approach that you can deal with in a patient with a corneal opacity. Of course you make your main port, you inject your dye, and then you do your rex side ports and you do your rexes before you do your rexes. This is a way of dealing with the moment, like use a, a endo illuminator, you could, this is intracamerally it is placed or you could go it through the past planar route where the back reflect, the reflection of the light from the retina comes. What essentially it does is it gives an oblique illumination as against the limited value of a coaxial illumination of the microscope, gives you a greater depth of focus. So you are able to actually do the good rexes as was shown to you. You are actually able to perceive the fragmentation which is occurring. The posterior capsule can be seen below. So you are able to go about with your steps, of course, with greater care. But then the surgical maneuver becomes so much more easier. It's a barely edited video. And you can see that the steps go on. The only challenge here is some amount of floppiness in the iris. So then the extra thing you need to do is to bring down your phaco parameters and be prepared that they may come to a point that you need to use your ret iris retractors in these cases. A bit of a supra capsule of phaco emulsification is also allowed because it's most important that you do a safe phaco in these eyes and definitely an endomillimeter usage is of a great value in these eyes with corneal opacity. And then going in and removing the cortex and placing the IOL what gets you, uh, bails you out from a surgery. Now when you're doing a phaco in a post PKI, it's important first to make your incision away outside the area of the graft. And of course, a very gentle phaco emulsification, you want to protect the endothelium, enough viscoelastic, the parameters need to be low. And we need to keep in mind that this graft which you have done, that there's, it's a pellicid type of uh, change which comes in these long standing grafts. And you need to keep in mind there could be a little wound leakage, you need to place a suture and remove these sutures after six weeks. Now supposing do you want to do a toric IOL in a post PKPI, then primarily you should wait remove all the sutures and then go in and do a cataract surgery and then place a toric IOL or if the intumescent cataract is so bothersome to the patient and if the sutures are not yet removed or partially removed, you need to do a monofocal IOL only in these cases and not uh, um, a toric IOL because it's not going to be an answer for your situation and of course incisions have to be created beyond the area of the graft. If you're doing a phaco emulsification in an eye which is had a DSEC. Again, of course, you need to avoid leaky wounds. You need to use cohesive viscoelastic and all that. But the only point here is because you have injected that lenticule in the eye earlier on, the posterior corneal curvature is more negatively powered. So you need to do your biometry such that the patient is left with a 0.7 to 1.5 diopter of myopia to compensate for the hyperopic shift which occurs because of injecting a lenticule in the eye. But so these minor adjustments, but there is no challenge of astigmatism in these eyes. Of course, if it's a larger graft, the hyperopia is greater. So a toric IOL is eminently possible in these eyes. In a DMEC eye, this negative lenticule effect is not there. So you could use normal IOL nanomograms and you could do a careful uh, surgery as is expected. Going on to keratoconus eye, the challenge becomes more. There's going to be multiple errors in your biometry and a lot of assumptions are taken in a keratoconic eye. So you might end up overestimating your K value because of which there's going to be an underestimation of your IOL part. The other challenge is because the, the irregularity of the cornea, there's going to be an irregularity of the tear film. Of course, biometry challenge is there. 
Then again, the visual access is not in line in the displaced cones. So therein again, there is another challenge. And again, many of these keratoconic eyes are myopic eyes. So you have to keep in mind factor in that there's going to be a long axial length and larger AC depth, which is going to affect your effective lens position. So best to use the latest formulae. And as far as the actual surgery goes, you need to make a small self-sealing incisions. And again, if the, it's an early keratoconus, the central visual axis is fine. You could probably uh, place a toric iol to debulk the astigmatism. But in severe cases with corneal thinning, you need to monitor the wound leakage. Then comes the other entity, which is a Fuchs uh, corneal endothelial uh, dystrophy. Now, what you need to remember here is that you, sorry, uh, the patient comes with blurred vision and glare and contrast. What is important for you is that, of course, as far as doing a phaco emulsification, with, wherein the corneal thickness has gone, not gone too high beyond that 640 cutoff mark, you could just bring down your phaco incision and then do a soft shell technique, use a low ultrasound energy. Uh, you could do in this manner, but you need to keep in mind that you have to down-regulate the inflammatory response because endothelium is an endothelium. Uh, neuroectoderm and that has to be kept in mind. Taking you through just running through the surgery, as was and said, the centurion machine ensures control. that uh, you are able to keep your IO in intraocular pressure optimal, you just keep your parameters low, you place your IO, and then all you need to do is to just uh, score out the uh, decimates with the endothelium and then use a sheet glide and place the uh, DSEC graph and so, uh, close the eye with an air bubble which ensures that position. And of course, uh, this I had already alluded, if the cutoff mark in a fuchs, there was some change of slide, I'm very sorry. Uh, you need to ensure that if the corneal thickness is significantly high, you have to combine the surgeries together. And uh, posi paucity of time, I'm not showing you how I would deal with this very opaque cornea. You need to do an anterior lamellar keratectomy, and you have enough deep stroma, you're able to visualize and go ahead and do the uh, cataract surgery, and then go ahead and remove it and do a, a PK graft. And last but not the least, in a Stephen Johnson syndrome, you need to stabilize the ocular surface, topical steroid drops, cyclosporin, and use all these adjuncts as, as uh, uh, depends on the severity of the disease, and of course, a careful phaco emulsification. And the last slide, if there is a herpes simplex and a herpes uh, zoster, then you need to an old one, a healed one. You should actually start the antivirals beforehand to prevent reactivation of the disease. So there are small, small measures which you need to take when you're dealing with a corneal disease and planning a cataract surgery. But if you are careful enough, and with these, uh, some of these messages which you already know, you will find that you're able to do a fairly good surgery in most of these cases. Thank you.